duty is sacrifice. It eclipses all things, even blood. In the making of season one, we knew half that season is a prologue and half of it is the first act of this war. To have season one land the way it did with a, a rabid audience, fans of George and his books the way I am. We were excited to get into it because this is the juicy part of the drama. The North owes a great duty to the Seven Kingdoms, one older than any oath. Winterfell is the one place, the one corner of this world where news of Luke's death has not yet reached. And it is this uh, hearkening back to a simpler time. I wanted to go to a place where we could experience that, if only briefly, and the North just felt completely the right way to go. Ryan, when we did speak, it really, really helped me out because we would have conversations about how important these negotiations are for Team Black and the, the difference it makes in the war. War is coming to the whole of the realm, my lord. We cannot wage it without the support of the North. Well, it was all about history. There were pledges that were made back in the day and Jace is sent to remind Craig and Stark of those pledges. If your greybeards can fight, the Queen will have them. They will fight hard, like Northerners. Rhaenyra heard the news that Luke has died on a mission that she sent him on, so there's guilt involved. And she's a mother who's lost a son and has to go through the sort of necessary grieving process that uh, Damon, um, her husband, can't really appreciate or understand. She goes and tries to make peace with Luke's demise, but she cannot settle in it because it is unsettled business until part of Arix washes ashore. Going in search of evidence is quite fundamentally important to her. I guess one of the sort of maddest things about death is that it seems sort of impossible especially because really the overriding feeling often is you just sit with the absence. And so anything that has like a tangibility about it, I think is vitally important. Her son's cloak, uh, the wing of his dragon. I think it's devastating, but I think it galvanizes a vengeful feeling, one that maybe she hasn't paid so much mind to previously. I think that Rhaenys is probably one of the few people that Damon knows he can't mess with, although I suspect probably wants to. We're going to King's Landing. To what end? Killing Vagar. When those two meet, it's kind of like a panther meets a kind of electric eel. Really dangerous combination. He's essentially ready to go to war and, and get payback. It was nice to throw those characters into conflict with one another. I think you can tell from even her demeanor the way uh, Rhaenys thinks of Daemon. Daemon believes that he's, of course, completely in the right and has the power to order Rhaenys around. Fly with me. It is a command. Would that you were the king. Where is your Harris? What do you need of him? Take him into the small council. He'll be king one day. He must begin his instruction. What if he does not want to be king? Where is he? One of the things I loved about Game of Thrones was character humor. And, you know, that we could spend a lot of time being dour in this world, and it's so important to have humor. And when I first saw what Tom Glenn Carney was doing with Aegon, I thought, he's finding humor where I didn't know it existed. And it's painful, a guy who's way in over his head, who really wants to do well, but it just can't make a right move, to, <laughs> no matter what he does. Aegon the Magnanimous. Hail King Aegon. The Magnanimous. I think Ekon is uh, the kind of father that encourages bad behavior because he finds it funny. He loves his kids. I have no doubt about that. He loves his kids dearly, but I, I, he's, he's not one to discipline them. If anything, he's, you know, having competitions with his children to see who can be the most rebellious. And Egon often wins. Would someone please? Is the heir to the throne bothering you, Tyland? We see him come into the small council meeting with Jaehaerys and uh, you know, he's, he's spurring him on, he's wanting him to be more of a, more of a rebel, more of a nuisance, just like his old man. I think he wants a ride. Your grace. A, a ride? A pony ride. Wouldn't that be fun, Jaehaerys? Should the master of coin be your royal steed? <laughs> <laughs> It's meant to be a moment of fun a bit, and yes, uh, look, Egon brings his, his four-year-old to work, but I think on a perhaps nuanced character level, this is the thing that Viserys never did for Egon, and Egon did not study at the feet of his father. His father 
had his male heir and then essentially said, well, that, that box is ticked, he was ill. I think he enjoyed having a son, but didn't put in the work the way he did with Rhaenyra when he was a younger man. And I think Aegon resents that and feels that part of the reason that he's not seen as being suited for the, for the crown or the throne is because he didn't get that training from his father, so now he's going to make up for that tenfold with Jaehaerys. Alicent's been in a marriage that was loving, but not exactly romantic or physical for quite some time. Cole has got a lot of issues. One of the things I love about the character is that he is a knight in shining armor and sort of classically handsome and probably the most messed up person in the story in, in many ways, you know, clinging to notions of purity and, and duty and just flagrantly breaking them left and right. So there's a lot of complex things driving the moves the closer and closer between Alicent and Cole. And it takes a leap forward, but nothing is simple with them. So for every leap forward, there's a pushback. We cannot. Again. There's a lot of wonderful tension there. I mean, I think there's love, but there's a lot of mess, too. <laughs> Hi, Grace. Good day. I think ultimately they're two very lost people in a pretty unforgiving world. And I, I think there's always been, you know, since the very first episode, Alison, you know, had her eye on Kristen Cole, and then she was a young lady, and now she's the queen of the Seven Kingdoms. It's paramount that she keeps it a secret because not only would her respect completely disintegrate, but her stay in the castle and Aegon is so unpredictable, who knows what he would do if he found out that his mother was having sex with his commander of the King's Guard. I mean, not only is it an embarrassment, it would bring deep, deep shame. I want him. Aemond Targaryen. Rhaenyra has literally one line in the first episode, and the one line she says, um, Daemon takes as a pulling the trigger. In our first episode, we see him unleash something that is sort of famous in the lore of House of the Dragon, a nasty event that he triggers. When Rhaenyra declares that she wants Aemond, I think it's an admission of a possibly shameful desire. And I think that admission is made directly to Damon. I think it's also an, an admission of their similarity. She sort of discloses another way in which they actually share a darkness. I Want Aemon Targaryen becomes the battle cry that then resonates across the entire season because that is the, the next domino to fall in this back and forth that sets in motion a uh, horrible attack and counterattack that continues and the atrocities grow worse and worse as they go. In our story, it's uh, Ms. Arya who has got her tentacles into every part of King's Landing, is able to provide like, connections for Damon to uh, exact revenge. I think it really is a big deal for the fans because it keeps getting referred to. And I don't know the character's actual names. They're forever in lore as blood and cheese. <laughs> who the fuck is she? <laughs> She's the queen, she is. A son for a son, he said. The boldest thing that I think we did there was decide to give the last 10 minutes of the episode over to these two characters that we had never met before and rely on them to take us through the end of the story and to see, hopefully, as they go deeper and deeper into the Red Keep and as we're spending more and more screen time on them, that something horrible is going to happen in there. And, and knowing that you're watching Game of Thrones and you don't know what is going to come for you from where and seeing that play out, hopefully, is the fun and the, and the horror for the audience that's yet to come.